Hello and welcome to Channel's Book Club. My name is Olakunle Kasumo, and I'm always excited to be on this show. I've got an interesting book with me here. Now, let me read out some names, and then you tell me the word that pops up in your head after I've read a number of those names here. Um, Bob Marley, Harry Belafonte, Marcus Garvey, Naomi Campbell, Peter Tosh, Yellow Man, Shaba Ranks, Sean Paul, um, Grace Jones, Notorious B.I.G., um, Jimmy Cliff, Donovan Bailey, Usain Bolt, John Burns, Raheem Sterling, Johan Blick, Gregory Isaacs, um, Buster Rhymes, Heavy D, Patrick Erwing, Linford Christie, Colin Powell, and on and on. So which word popped up? in your head. Somebody I read this list to said, mega celebrities. <laughs> and I laughed. I said, okay, well, you're right. But the word that should pop up in your head is Jamaica. That small island of 2.9 million people, they are about small but mighty, you have to say, considering what the country has given the world in terms of arts and sports and uh, i mean all manner of things look at the names i just rolled out now all have jamaican heritage great country but jamaica has histories that are connected to africa to black africa to west africa to nigeria and nigeria has a special relationship with jamaica now our guest on the show this week is special special on a num for a number of reasons. Number one, she was our very first guest on this show years ago. I'm talking about the one and only Coco Kalango. And uh, special for a number of reasons, I said. Another reason is when you talk about promotion of literature in Nigeria, this woman is just up, up there. She's given her life to promoting literature in Nigeria. And thirdly, for this special project. I'm going to tell you more about this project, but this is a book that sheds light on Jamaica and the relationship of Jamaica with Nigeria and the history of Jamaicans in Nigeria. We'll tell you more about this, but let's get to meet Coco Kalango once again and then dive into this book, her latest book titled One Love. Coco Kalango is a freelance writer and author born to a Jamaican mother and a Nigerian father. Kalango is the founder of the Rainbow Book Club, which promotes reading culture and later culminated in Port Harcourt being UNESCO's World Book Capital in 2014. Her passion for literacy and history drove her into researching the relationship between Jamaica and Nigeria, which birthed her most recent book, One Love, Over 100 Years of Jamaican contributing to Nigeria's development. Kalango joins Channel's book club to discuss One Love. Coco Kalango, nice to have you on Channel's <laughs> book club. I'm so happy to be here, Kunle. Thank you very much for having me and well done. Thank you, thank you. Now, you may not remember, maybe you do, but um, you were the first guest we had on this show. How can I forget? <laughs> 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 and that's such a privilege. Thank uh, you. Oh, wow. Thanks. It's an honor. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so you've traveled this journey with us for, for so many years. And I'll keep, keep at it with yes, you. Yes, <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And well done. I mean, everything you've done over the years for, for literature in Nigeria is just amazing. Um, we cannot talk about the history of literature development and promotion in contemporary Nigeria without mentioning Coco Kalango. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Well done. <laughs> it's an honor well to done. serve Nigeria. Well Keep pushing. Thank you. And uh, uh, I mean, before we dig into this, are you happy with what you've seen in the last um, 10, 20 years in terms of how much, how far we have come as a country in terms of uh, promotion of literacy, and um, literature generally? Well, yes and no. You know, yes, when I see people like you and, and channels television, you know, actively promoting reading, um, when we see 
people, as you know, pockets of insignificant work, mm. but which are just so precious to this um, country. People doing things in their different corners. I follow um, the Channels Book Club. I always try to watch. And you do a good Thank job. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> highlighting such stories. So it's encouraging. Um, but on the other hand, I don't think we are where we ought to be. Um, I had always said when we were running the book festival in Port Harcourt that we needed book festivals in all the states in Nigeria. We can't have enough of it. So we need more um, encouragement. We need the corporates mm. to support this sort of initiative. Mm. It's not something one person or one organization can do. You know, we need those with deep pockets to come and back <laughs> yeah. the, the wonderful work people like you are doing. So mm. yes and no. Mm, I hope you can hear. <laughs> well done on this incredible work. Ah, no, one love over 100 years of Jamaicans contributing to Nigeria's development. It is a seminal work. Well done. Because um, nothing like this has ever been done. This is the first of its type. And uh, uh, you've just set a new path. Uh, but let's, before we dig into the book, this is a book about Jamaicans and Nigerians. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Your own story probably explains why you've done this work. Am, am I correct? Yes. Share, share a bit of that with us. I'd be glad to. So my mom is, was Jamaican. She died two years ago. And um, just like a lot of the people in, the, in this book, she um, migrated with what is called the Windrush generation in the 50s to the United Kingdom. There she met my father, who was a law student at the University of Hull, and she was studying um, nursing. So they fell in love, got married, and then they came to Nigeria together in 1958. Oh. And yes, as they say, the rest is history. But basically, this book is inspired by my mother's life because naturally I grew up knowing the Jamaican community in Nigeria, and particularly in Port Harcourt where I grew up, and the wider West Indian um, community. And having grown with all these people and their stories growing on me, you know, I felt, you know what? Their generation as well is dying out in the sense that so many Jamaicans are not coming to Nigeria again like they did in the 50s. So I said, you know what? Someone needs to tell the story. Someone needs to let generations unborn know that these people came and above all, they contributed. So that's mm. why I decided to write, write this, this book here. Yeah. Mm. So let's get to introduce the book to viewers. Um, One Love. You got that title from Bob Marley's Bob Marley, classic, yes. Right? <laughs> I did. One love, ah, one love, love. let's get, get together, together and feel all right. right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, so let's, um, what, what, what is One Love about, this, this work? Okay, as the title goes, One Love is supposed to show the connection and emotion, the affinity mm. between Nigeria and Jamaica. Okay. So it's a coffee table book. In it, I've told 50 stories of Jamaicans that came to Nigeria, beginning with um, the people that came with Reverend Hope Wardle mm. in 1846. Mm. So the book is divided into three parts. The first part is those who came between 1846 and 1914, when Nigeria was created. Then the second part is those who came from 1915 to 1960, 60, so the amalgamation to independence. And part three is really those who came after 1961 to date. And um, it shows how Jamaicans have contributed to building Nigeria through you know, medicine, education, agriculture, media, and so many other fields. So the first printing press was started at the Hope Waddle Training Institution. Yes, I believe he started it, Sorry. although the school was set up after he had left Nigeria. So when he came mm -hmm. to Nigeria then, he came with um, the first people, the first Jamaicans in your book. Yes. Here. Are, they, are you talking about Andrew, Andrew and Edward? Yes. Andrew Chis. Chisholm. Yes. I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> and Forgive Edward me. Miller. And Edward Miller. Yes. Okay. So they came with Hope Waddle. Yeah. In 1846. 46. Interesting. Hmm. But before then, 
Nigerians had been, well, before we were known as Nigerians, people from here had been taken to Jamaica, right? Slave, yes. During the slave era, slave trade era, right? Definitely. And that's where mm. people like my mother are descendants of the slaves that were taken from Africa, you know, to the West Indies, to the New World, to work in the plantations. So, yes, indeed. So, for the people in this book, this was like a homecoming, you know, coming homecoming, back yeah. home to So, many Africa. Jamaicans, uh, many Jamaicans connect their roots to this part of the world. Yes, that particularly we now, that West we Africa. Nigeria. Yes, indeed. Mm. Ghana, you know, mm -hmm. particularly West Africa. Mm. Interesting. Right. Now, which of these stories um, touched you? I mean, you, you've gone through 50. They probably all do, but I mean... In different ways. Which one, <laughs> ah, which, which one struck you as you read, as you researched? Which one stands out for you? Maybe one, two or three of them? Okay, sure. I mean, naturally, my mom's first. <laughs> my mom was studying nursing, you know, but she came back and my dad was a lawyer and she put her career aside to raise, you know, help support him and raise um, the children. But later, when we're all much older, mm. she set up a school in Port Harcourt, Springfield um, School, named after her village in Jamaica. And mm. that was over 40 years ago. And the school has trained thousands of children. So that's been so wonderful. But there are other people like... Um, Your mother, by the way, is Claire, right? Yes, Claire Bassi. That's in part two. In part Claire two. Lorena Bassi. Yes, Nee Dixon. Nee Dixon, okay. Yes, but there are other people like uh, Dr. Grillo, Dorothea Baxter Grillo. She was Nigeria's first doctor of anatomy. Wow. Um, she came in with her husband, who was a doctor as well, the great um, Dr. Grillo. And she taught at the universities of, uh, I believe, Meiduguri, Ife, and finally in University of Benin. She was about 90 when I interviewed her. Oh. But before the book came out, she passed. Oh. So we, we've had several. We have uh, Michael Williams right now, who works with Ebony Life as marketing and communications director, who's been instrumental in pushing out, you know, Nollywood yeah. films, particularly the ones from yeah. um, Ebony Life TV. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. What was this like for you, putting this together, um, considering your roots and then also considering the enormous, I'm guessing, enormous challenges putting this kind of work together, 50 different people across generations? It was a lot of work, and I did it over, like, four years. Um, I started researching. You know, I wasn't sure I would be the one to tell the story, but I started researching. Then I took a trip to Jamaica to celebrate my 50th birthday. And then I visited the grave side of my grandparents. And when I was there, it was really emotional for me, you know. So mm -hmm. on, that, on the spot, so I decided, you know what? I'm going to tell the story. And then I started. Mm -hmm. And then my mom was not too well. She had challenges with her memory. Um, and I was, I was on it. <laughs> then she passed. So to, to cope with that pain, I worked day and night to make sure the book came out before we buried her. Mm. And I did that in um, November 2020. Mm. So she <laughs> saw. She, she, she did. She held a copy of this before she... Uh, she didn't hold a physical copy, but I used to tell her about it. Yeah, she, she, she did see yeah. the dummy of it, and I used oh, to tell her about oh, it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Incredible. Mm. But it's encouraging. I mean, you know, Wale Shoinka, who was at the virtual launch, as you can remember, I, I remember said this book is an important contribution to the literature of the African diaspora. So, you know, when you, when you hear those sort of words and words from people like you inviting me here, then it's encouraging, you know, and whatever difficulty one went through to do such a work is, is well worth it. Jamaica is 60 years. This year. This year, 60 yes. years independence. In, independence, indeed. Th th this year. Yes. And, and again, it's, it's, it's interesting how your book got me curious and I just went, you know, searching and all that. When, so when I saw from your book that it's 60 years that um, Jamaica got an independence, I was curious, who was the colonial um, master, as we like to, <laughs> we like to <laughs> describe, describe them, of um, Jamaica? And I went searching and I said, United Kingdom. Yes. Said, yeah, they come again. <laughs> they, they, they colonize the whole Everywhere. world. Everywhere. <laughs> somehow, before yeah. I checked, I had thoughts that it will be 
some North American or South American, you know. So when I saw, I said, United Kingdom, oh, well. So that's another thing we share, we have in common. Yes. And no one that, Commonwealth. Yeah, no one that Commonwealth. Jamaica also, of course, uh, runs, um, participates in the Commonwealth. Yes, indeed. Why did I even need to search? That, that was my answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Um, thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and well done on this great work you, you, you have here. Thank you so much, Kunle. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Always a lot to talk about when you're with Coco Kalango. Great woman, great woman. Now, up next, this is very special because... Our reader now, our author, who is going to be doing a reading for us, is one of us. When I say one of us, I mean one of us here at Channels TV. The very charming, millicent, lawyer, news anchor, broadcaster, journalist, and a whole lot of other things this lady is. But you, you definitely know her face. <laughs> when you see her, you say, oh, that's millicent, that's millicent. Millicent has come up with a book that you absolutely have to read and we had to pull her out to come and do a reading for us on this show now let's get to meet millicent and her new book enjoy this hi i'm millicent walker a journalist broadcast journalist i like to call myself as well a development journalist and I'm also a lawyer. I was called to the Nigerian bar in 2009. The journey of the book, Legal Angle, started um, when I was a youth corps member posted to the Ministry of Justice in Lafia, that's in Nassau State. It was an interesting experience. It was my first experience on my own in the northern part of the country. Um, what I did was I gave legal advice on cases I went to court when required as well. However, my further interaction with the people and the role I played birthed this book uh, called Legal Angle. It started as a show on the law, enlightening people about their rights, a reminder of their responsibilities. The book uses popular examples of conflict, um, like tenancy issues, um, I mean, um, issues surrounding contracts and then other issues, breaking down the processes and procedures into bite sizes, little bits, um, explanatory as well. Take, for example, chapter one. I titled chapter one, Landlord versus Tenant. Um, and the very first question I asked the, a guest I had, who was a legal practitioner at the time was, what kind of contract does a landlord and his tenant engage in? This was the response. Generally, the contract between a landlord and his tenant is called a tenancy agreement. By landlord, we're referring to a person who owns a building or land and leases the land, building, or part of it to another person who is called the tenant. So, I mean, that was like a clear, simple explanation of really what that entails, you know, um, a tenant and uh, what, uh, of course, a landlord means. And my next question was, some tenants enter into oral agreements, many still do, um, with their landlords. Is that advisable? Well, it would depend on the parties involved, was his response. It is, however, legally advisable that all agreements be written so that they may be tendered as evidence in the instance of a breach or disagreements. And we know this is the world. There are breaches, there are disagreements um, every now and again. But I wanted further explanation because if people you know, heard this, you know, um, what, would, you know, what they should look out for in terms of when something goes wrong, when there's a conflict. And it says that if there are private individuals who understand themselves without any dispute as to the terms and conditions, then they may toe the line of oral agreement. Nevertheless, it is legally unadvisable. On the other hand, if the parties are artificial parties, for example, a company or an individual and a natural party or both, then such an agreement must be under seal 
The reason is that according to the Companies and Allied Matters Act and several other statutory provisions, uh, like the property and surveying law, the companies must enter into a written agreement. And the necessity for that, even among private individuals, is hinged on the tendencies of the failings of the human memory, um, the uncertainty of human nature. For example, if you have the contract written and duly executed by the parties, it is impossible to deny that such an agreement exists. And this is essentially, um, you know, when it's used as a reference for future purposes. So this is how I started the book, Legal Angle. These issues, several other chapters in the book um, to really talk about how some of these very simple legal issues, how they affect um, the human populace. And, but, but there's also another chapter that I'd like to talk about, uh, and that is chapter five. Now, this is titled, um, get into chapter five over here. This is one of my favorite chapters, um, National Development and Ethical Values. First, when you look up what that means, national development, just typing it on the internet, um, Byju's, I believe, on the internet defines it as the capacity of the country to raise the standard of living of its residents. It can be achieved by providing individuals with basic livelihood requirements, you know, supplying them with employment, better opportunities, shelter, eradication of poverty, health care. As a core member, and till this moment, I've always felt that Nigeria has a lot of potential, hence uh, this chapter. And so my very first question at the time was, what is this concept of national development? And we were talking 2010 when I actually wrote this book. Economic, social or political, national development is set to bring valuable and positive changes that improve the living standards of a populace. Some have wondered about the possibility of succeeding, especially where the constitution, and that's the Nigeria constitution, 1999 as amended, provides for it in a chapter that is not justifiable. Chapter two, you must be familiar with that. But according to an article that was written by uh, Victor E. D. K. Values education is an important part of national development. He said that values education involves educating for character and for good morals. It is the teaching of respect and responsibility and other values to citizens for good character and development and for the health of the nation. However, there is also a rule of law which over the years we become familiar with equality of opportunity due process representative governments the importance of checks and balances and essentially democratic decision making which are procedural values that define democracy something we just celebrated june the 12th but the fundamental moral values that a society should teach its citizens are respect responsibility others include honesty, fairness, tolerance, prudence, self-discipline, compassion, courage, and cooperation. These will enable the people create a viable society. There are several problems which still permeate around the world. Um, and there are also increasing moral problems in the country, some of which include um, corruption, dishonesty, greed, political killing, and other destructive behaviors. And essentially, my point in chapter five was that there is a call for the values education in society, and that we shouldn't depart from that. If we can settle that at the core of you know, the young, perhaps we would look forward to a better, uh, much more rich uh, country. The book goes on and on and, and talks about, you know, quite a lot of important things that I think you need to know. Legal Angle is a book for everyone. I think you should, you know, go out there, get a copy, learn more about it, buy for your friends. It's really an easy, law made easy. It's a book for everyone. Thanks and I hope you enjoyed my reading.
let me let you into a secret on uh, about television. You know, when you see people on television, they'll smile, they'll look good, look great, and all that. But the characters might be mm, slightly different <laughs> behind the cameras. But Millicent, what you see is what you get. Fantastic lady. And that's a book you really have to read. So get yourself a copy and dig in. This is where we have to end the show today. As always, we'll be delighted to get your feedback through any of our social media platforms displayed on your screen. My name is Ola Kule Kasumo. Remember, one great book can change your life. Bye-bye.